welcome everybody. Uh, you know, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. I see people checking into the chat from all over the places. We have Germany, we have Pakistan, uh, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, me personally, I am uh, here in colorful Colorado in a basement, uh, so no mountains behind me, but I am in a, uh, a beautiful state here in, in, in the United States uh, in mountain time zone. Um, I'm excited about this session today. I've been, I've been, have, I've had this session on my calendar for for a while now. Um, this is the combination of two things that I love. Uh, one being uh, software as a service, the other being Kubernetes, and I guess the third being CockroachDB. We we can't not talk about this without talking about, um, you know, Cockroach Database, which I'm a proud member of this team. Been following this company for really quite some time. Uh, back in the days when I was at CoreOS working on Kubernetes. Uh, and just demonstrating, you know, what is what does a, a truly resilient application look like? I think way back in the day, I had uh, you know Spencer Kimball, the CEO of Cockroach Labs, and um, and Alex Bolvi, who was the one of the founders of CoreOS, on stage at uh, at OpenStack Summit, actually killing clusters, killing pods, and seeing a database survive all this stuff. So this is the culmination of a lot of different things for me. I'm pretty excited about this session today. So. Um, that's our topic. I, I think Kubernetes is a pretty hot topic. A lot of you registered and, and um, we're pretty excited. So thank you all for joining. Um, it really does mean the world for to us. Uh, this, this cockroach hour has been a little bit of a labor of love and we, we've had some, some, some pretty decent success with it so far. So thanks again. Um, quick housekeeping. Um, there is a QA panel. There's chat. Um, people are already engaged in the chat. Thank you. Um, New Jersey has just checked in. India, Denver. Hey, Green. Den hey, Denver. I'm, I'm here as well, Brandon. Um, engage in the chat, <clears throat> talk amongst yourselves, talk with the panelists. Um, we, we love the chat uh, and, and lighting that up is great. So thank you for joining there. Um, a recording, as I said, will definitely be available afterwards as well. Uh, and so, uh, like I said, all of these are up on our, our YouTube channel, free and available to everybody. Um, there are members of our team that are in the chat as well. Um, I know Michael Gardard, a friend of mine, loving my shirt today representing California, both up here and here, Michael. Um, and so uh, they'll, 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 they'll engage with you in the chat as well. I'm gonna try to monitor both the chat and help with the conversation um, along the way. Um, but yeah, I think our team will, will actually help with, with this stuff as well. So, um, all right, so let's get started. Um, so uh, Josh and Juan are my two guests today. Uh, if you guys wanna come on the video, that's great. So, um, in the, in, in the past, we've been asked to kind of say, are these sessions going to be beginner, intermediate, advanced? You know, advanced is, you know, distributed transactions with Andrew Werner. You know, that's some really, really deep software engine stuff. You guys, you guys are just intermediate. I mean, this Kubernetes thing is simple. It's easy. So, um, so I kind of gauge this thing as a little bit of an intermediate because we're going to have to get a little bit technical here. I'm not going to have any code samples or anything, but, um, you know, we'll get into some, some details around, you know, operators and Kubernetes and Borg and, these choices and how you provision hardware and manage services and all these things. So, um, but today we're gonna we're gonna talk a lot about. Um, well, I have three bullets here: Kubernetes, Kubernetes, Kubernetes. Um, but but please again engage uh, in the chat, engage in the QA. Uh, my friend JP is monitoring um, these things as well, and um, you know, so for some of the best questions, um, we're gonna send out coffee mugs. I'm sorry, Juan and Josh, I didn't we didn't get the coffee mugs to you in time for today. I don't even have mine yet, so. Um, but I wanted to welcome um, the guests on the show today. So um, Juan and Josh, welcome. So you guys come off, come off. Uh, you're you're on now. Everything you say is recorded. So um, so so let's just start with a quick introduction. Juan, um, welcome to the show. Can you just tell me uh, what your role is here at Cockroach Labs and how long you've been with the with the company? Well, I'm one of the old people here. I mean, I've been here for a long time, which is four months. Uh, a lot of people are newer than that. Uh, I've um, yeah, I'm the uh, manager of the Site Reliability Engineering Team, SRE, which uh, does SRE and a lot of other things because we're growing in all directions. Um, That's right. Yeah. Awesome. And then Josh? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Josh. I'm the, the tech lead of the SRE team at Cockroach Labs. Uh, I've been here for about a year and a half. Awesome. So I miss seeing you, Josh, I guess, in the lunchroom. Juan, we never really got to work together. I guess the pandemic hit and we never really got to actually, you know, that's right. Outside of outside of Zoom, but um, you know this this team has grown a lot over the past uh, year, right? I mean, Josh, how many people did we have at the very beginning for our SRE team? You were one of the originals, right? Yeah, there was there was one person who had been kind of at Cockroach Labs forever, 
And I don't think they were technically called an SRE way, way back when, but in spirit, they were an SRE. Yeah. Um, and then me and this one other person, Joel, joined yeah. in January of last year. And it was yeah. a three-person team for about six months. And then how many are we at today, Juan? We're at eight right now. Eight. Uh, and we're still looking to expand, but COVID is making that a little difficult at the moment. Yeah, well, that was my way of creating at least like a, you know, I got my recruiting team's going to love us because I just said, hey, we're hiring. We love <laughs> SREs. Uh, and, and I, you know, I think any company, you can't get enough SREs. It's such a critical role for what we're doing with Cockroach Cloud. You guys, thank you because the, the work you're doing and, you know, being on call all the time is also one of those things that I'm sure it's not always that fun. So, but hey, SREs are, are valuable people. So, and, and, and so guys, thank you for joining me today. Um, you know, we had a little bit of a talk track. I'm just going to go off of sharing slides. I don't, you know, we'll just, it's, it's us talking. I'll, I'll come back and forth through a couple of things. So um, I just want to start the conversation. I typically start somewhere with kind of where, where we all came from and, and, you know, how we got to this role. So, you know, I, I found Kubernetes, Oh gosh, it was, I was at the very first KubeCon that Joseph Jacks ran, like in San Francisco, it was like 120 people at the Intercontinental in San Francisco. And it was kind of cool, right? It was like this huge, massive, like really like robust, cool group of people all really excited about it. And I, I think I've only missed one KubeCon. Uh, and, I, and I checked in last week, actually. I hope everybody here on the call did too, because it was pretty cool. Um, but um, you know, Josh, how did you come to Kubernetes? And, and you know, what's been your experience with you know, how, how you got to kind of managing and being an SRE in this world? Um, I, so when I joined a year and a half ago, we were running a few cockroach cloud clusters, maybe like four, and we weren't using Kubernetes. Um, but at that point, you know, we only had four clusters, we didn't need a lot of automation. And also our product was like very simple. It was just, we would, we would ask customers for like what details they want, like what their cluster should look like. And then we'd like manually spin up their cluster. Right. There was no like nice UI that lets you create clusters automatically. Right. And that was the big thing that the team was working on back then. And that's when we started considering Kubernetes in relation to like solving those automation problems. Right. But you had experience with Kubernetes prior to joining Cockroach Labs, right? Kind of, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so I was at Google before Cockroach Labs. Yeah, right. um, but we didn't use Kubernetes, but we used something very similar to Kubernetes called Borg. Um, and so I was really used to like an SRE team having that tool and not having to deal with uh, doing like certain low level automation tasks. Right. And so I, I was pushing that. And there were some other SREs that were nervous about the complexity of Kubernetes and there was a lot of argument. Yeah. So I, I want to explore a little bit about our decision to use Kubernetes underneath CockroachDB. And I think it's going to be valuable to people just to see that that decision process and when does Kubernetes make sense or not. Um, I, I do think... You know, I wasn't exposed to the SRE role until I kind of got into the Kubernetes space. And I think it's changed the way that we think about DevOps and admin and the whole thing. It's, it's a wholly different thing, right? And, you know, to me, it's kind of like, I think the companies that are doing things that are interesting over the next couple of years are those that are rooted in it's a lot of things that happened at Google. So, uh, you know, great lineage, you guys. And I, I think it's right, right? Because I think that's the background. Juan, you have a similar background as well, right? Sorry about that. Yeah, um, I was at Google for five or six, between five and six years as well. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, of course, managing a large distributed system in Google is easy compared to almost anywhere else. And basically, I think going to Kubernetes over the past three years, I guess, uh, has been just an effort to replicate as much as I could the Borg experience inside Google. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. And you made a stop between us and Google as well, where you guys went down the path of trying to choose Kubernetes as well, right? And you ended up not choosing it, right? So yeah. as much as you can talk about that, why didn't you choose Kubernetes? I guess oh, let's start was, there before we say why we did, right? I was a major advocate of trying to do Kubernetes there. Yeah. Uh, the problem in that, the problem in that uh, outfit was that, well, basically they had too much money. They had built a whole scheduler by themselves um, some of their, it was a financial company, some of their financial models uh, hardwired the number of uh, compute nodes that they had to run on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it made the coding easier and, you know, they didn't have the best computer scientists writing the financial models because they wanted to keep them secret. So uh, anyway, uh, long story short, they have a built-in infrastructure that was really bad. 
but the perceived risk of moving to something new and something failing on, on the way uh, was too high, so they just didn't want to experiment, basically. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they'll stay there for a while. Yeah, I find a lot of that in my conversations with people who are adopting. It's like, yeah, it's risky. And the risk that I see with a lot of companies is operational expertise. Like, we're going to get this thing, but we don't have anybody internally who's actually dealt with it, you know? And I think yeah. and we struggle that with CockroachDB as well. I mean, honestly, I mean, you know, to be forthright, really, like, you know, people will start small projects with Cockroach Database because they need developers who are familiar with it. They need to figure out how to, like, run the thing. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's risky to adopt new software without having the people. And I think that's, I think that's common. And uh, yeah. that's kind of one of those things, right? So, um, but let's get into kind of our choice. Um, you know, Josh, you wrote a great, a great blog post. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to share a screen again, because I want to show everybody this thing. Um, Josh wrote a great blog post, y'all. Uh, it's on our blog roll. No, it's not there. Why we run, and I, I, I have to use tab suspender because I have like 8 million tabs open. Um, so why we run a managed cockroach DB instance on Kubernetes, on Kubernetes. And, you know, this is, I guess, over a year ago now, Josh, that we went through this decision. I can't believe that was a year ago, but you were here for that decision and it was heated as I remember. Right. And so, you know, I, I, there's probably like 80 different angles that we can take on this, but what was our kind of decision to go with Kubernetes? What was it really built on? I, I know it's summarized here, but just kind of run, run us through that for the audience. Um, yeah, so I think that the, there's, there's different benefits to Kubernetes. And when we were talking about this, they were very mixed up in my mind. And as a result of talking about it a lot, they became like more separate. And right. early on, we really cared about some of those benefits and not others. Uh, so I think the benefits are, one, you get all these really powerful automation primitives. That benefit was like top of our mind because we knew we were going to build this managed service where customers could scale up clusters, they could upgrade clusters. We just needed to do a lot of automation tasks at a high level of reliability. And we didn't want to build that ourselves. Kubernetes right. is one means of doing that. Um, there's another benefit which I think is often in people's heads, including my head, and it's this bin packing capability Kubernetes has where you can run lots of containers on a single VM. And the interesting thing about early Cockroach Cloud is we didn't care about that at all because we wanted to run one Cockroach node per VM because we wanted the whole VM for Cockroach DB. Right. Um, so we didn't even need that benefit. And there's a lot of complexity that comes from those two requirements like being implemented by Kubernetes. And we were taking on that complexity in order to get only some of the benefits of Kubernetes almost. Right. Let me, let me just ask you a question about bin packing, Josh. I mean, it's a term that is relatively new to me. I kind of have a sense of what it is. Um, just explain to me what that means. Does it just mean like multiple pods on a single VM? Is it, you know, is it as simple as that or what, what is it? Yeah. What I mean by that is like we, Kubernetes lets you pack a bunch of containers on a VM in a way that improves resource utilization. You can use up the whole VM if like, if, one of the pods is not using as much resources, another pod can use more. Like this right. is one of the motivating reasons for like Google's Borg thing is mm -hmm. they, they realized like how much resource resources they could save by bin packing containers onto, I guess for them machines. Right, which ultimately ends up, it, it's a cost saving, right? It's not, I mean, like, it ends yeah. up being a huge massive utilization. And when you're running software as a service, look at, we've got to cover our costs of doing these things. And, you know, there's some interesting things that we're doing to run multi-tenant. We'll get into that and, and multi-region and all these things. But but utilization of the VM itself, I mean, it's, VMware built a pretty big company off of, you know, uh, optimizing CPU, right? So optimizing v VM is, is, I think, a really interesting topic. And if, you know, people on the audience aren't familiar with that, I think it's definitely an area to go chase down because I, I just feel like when I first heard of it, I was like, wow, Google really squeezes every single drop out of every single compute cycle, almost every like cycle they can, right? I mean, it's like, talk about, talk about optimization, right? So, so that, that kind of, I'm going to come back to a little bit more on the decision, Josh, but like Juan, when we look at kind of Borg and Kubernetes, and I think, you know, Borg was definitely the, the, the predecessor of Kubernetes, Kubernetes being fairly different than, than Borg. You know, what was the, what are the big differences between those two environments that, that you saw from Google and then kind of working with in the Kubernetes world now? Uh, 
Well, I, I think I would have to say that the first, the most important difference is that inside Google, inside your data center, you can do provisioning at the same time as you do orchestration, right? So yeah. Kubernetes is able to orchestrate on a cluster that you give it, but you still have to give it. Uh, so you still have a lot of work to create that infrastructure to come up with the computers that Kubernetes uh, can run on. So that's a big deal. Um, and the other, uh, another different, I mean, I'm just uh, talking off the cuff, but another big, uh, big difference I think is that Google takes care to, per, to assign priorities to everything that runs on the system. Um, yeah. And I don't think, I don't know if Kubernetes is planning to do that, but that allows that BIM, BIM packing to be a lot more perfect, right? So you can put a high priority thing in the same machine as low priority things. And then um, it also has mechanisms to move process, running processes from one machine to another. Um, so that allows that BIM packing to be a bit more dynamic. Uh, you know, it, you don't get stuck with two heavy processes running yeah. on the same machine. Um, yeah, I think that's that's definitely one of those challenges, Juan, that, that you know, prioritizing resources uh, is really interesting. And from a hardware point of view, especially from a workload or compute point of view, I know we're trying to do things like prioritizing queries in Cockroach DB. I know that's a feature that we're going down as well. Like, I think that's one of those those areas. Like for me in the Kubernetes community, that's a big deal. And I think it's like I think it's a, a good way to push, right? But it's, again, it comes back to this this optimization, right? And so let's go back to Josh, like, so the, the choice of Kubernetes, I'm sure we had a couple of other things that we were looking at. What else were we looking at at the time? Uh, we, so we, we had this like existing way of managing clusters and the, the way was basically, we used Terraform to spin up VMs and then mm -hmm. we ran Cocker GB on those VMs with supervisor scripts and some like homegrown automation. Right. And yeah, I mean, so that, that was in some way the thing we were comparing Kubernetes to because it's what we had. Right. And the, you know, the benefits of that was it was, it was very, it was very simple. Like you just have a VM and right. then you just this process running. That's it. Which SRE liked. Like it's not, there, there's not tons of moving pieces that you have to understand. Um, but the cost was that it, it was rather hard to do orchestration tasks. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you're truly going to be an SRE, I mean, that's where the true value comes in. And so you also mentioned something, Josh. So it's kind of like hand rolled deployments versus like we needed something. Right. And so, you know, there's things like Nomad, which I like Nomad, honestly. I, I love what, uh, you know, Mitchell and Armand have done over at HashiCorp. I think it's a undervalued sometimes kind of option. Um, you know, I mean, I think what Mesosphere was doing with Mesos and with, uh, you know, that was interesting as well. Kubernetes won out though, and it's it, now I think it's a battle of resources and getting people who have expertise. And to me, it's kind of like that battle's kind of won. I still do think Nomad's an interesting option for this this sort of thing. I don't know if you guys have, have ever looked at that, but um, Josh, you you also mentioned there was a bunch of like the core capabilities of of Kubernetes that was interesting when we first went down this path. But ultimately, in the end, there's a lot of other things with Kubernetes that we're gaining benefit from today. Correct. So, like, can you just talk through that? Yeah, that's, I think that's one of the most interesting things to me about this whole, this whole thing, because what happened is we wanted these like automation primitives and we did get them, but it turned out that building rather basic pieces of automation on top of Kubernetes was still pretty hard. Um, and we can talk more about that, but like rather simple things like scaling up and down a cockroach cluster on Kubernetes due to details of what Cocker should be wants in terms of where we place nodes and availability zones and other things became more complicated than simply sending like one API call to Kubernetes. Right. Um, I think the big benefits that we did it totally expect or we a little bit expected, but have really been big are one, it's just providing this very like common interface that we can run applications on. And we're running already on two clouds, GCP and AWS. And we mm -hmm. want to work more and you have this like surface area of this, this consistent way of running pr production yeah. applications. And that's powerful. And then two kind of related as we build, as we evolve CockroachDB, uh, in particular, as we build like more multi-tenant versions of CockroachDB, uh, being able to run multiple pods on a VM becomes really important. Yeah. Yeah, in, in any time you get to that world. It, it, it's basically, it, it's a nice path to a more advanced implementation and automation, right? And so, you know, Juan, what what did, what does the SRE team spend their time dealing with mostly right now, like from a Kubernetes point of view? And it's so funny, I asked this question because I know there was a, like a big blow up this morning, whatever, but like, let's not get into anything that happened today. 
<laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, you know, what, what do they spend most of their time working on on your team? Well, so the team spends most of the time working on things that are not directly Kubernetes related, with one exception from a month ago, which I, I, I will go over. Um, so most of our issues are, you know, monitoring CRDB, um, adding things to the product itself so that it can recover more automatically. Isolation, right? So one, one user doesn't uh, end up displacing another, that sort of thing. We're making great strides on all that, but they are not Kubernetes related issues. Um, right. the, the one that I will mention as an example with Kubernetes, I think uh, Josh was alluding to it. Um, the way that Kubernetes uh, places uh, stateful sets across your infrastructure, um, I think they rely on a sequential order uh, to make sure pods end up being in different uh, availability zones. But um, well, there are complications with how uh, you scale something up and then how you downscale it and you end up uh, shooting yourself in the foot. So we had to write up our, our own custom Kubernetes schedulers to get around that. Um, you know, that's a feature or that's a problem that Kubernetes is addressing in version, I think, 1.19. But we're running into that sort of thing. So we're having to kind of supplement Kubernetes uh, where it doesn't do exactly what we need because, you know, we have a product that... Uh, it's difficult to orchestrate that uh, a lot of its features rely on it being geographically distributed, right? Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, and so Juan, how much, like, so this is a really important point, especially when it comes to the intersection of cockroach database and Kubernetes, because I don't think people have actually run into the problem with the scheduler that we have, right? Like, I think this is fairly unique because of the geography and how yeah. much like location is important to cockroach database. We ended up having to make some fairly significant changes or basically build a custom scheduler, right? And so I think Chris Cito, Chris is on your team, right, Juan? Yeah. And yeah. and yeah, Chris has a blog post that's coming out over the next I I, I just went through it uh, in the next couple of days, but we're gonna actually talk about our custom scheduler. But can yeah. you guys just go into a little bit? I don't know if Juan or Josh, one of you guys want to take this. Like, what did we have to do with a scheduler that was very different because of the the geography, right? Because of the physical location of pods and, and, and regions and AZs. What did we have to do? If you guys could get into that. Josh, uh, can, can, I mean, I, <laughs> I, will, I, I no, no, I, I will have to take 30 seconds to answer that question properly, but maybe you can yeah. do it right now. Yeah. Uh, I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> okay, so I think the problem, the problem is we want to we want the the ordinals of the pods to be uh, distributed across availability zones in such a way that when we scale down the higher numbered pods, like say we let's do an example. Let's say we have a six node cluster and we're going to go from six nodes to three nodes, and let's say we're running in a region with three availability zones. Then when we get rid of pod six, pod five, pod pod four, it must be the case that the, those we get rid of one pod in each AZ. That's right. And that's the, that's the thing that Kubernetes wasn't doing for us that we yes. expected they would. And so yeah. we were to did it. Yeah, it, it's a pretty simple example. It's really all about survivability. It's all about disaster recovery. And it's like, it's one of these kind of core things in Kubernetes, which is actually really important. When you're running in a single AZ, it's pretty easy, right? Like kill a pod, I still have eight others. And by the way, Kubernetes just bring it back up in the same AZ. However, if you want to survive, what, like, what is your disaster recovery plan? Like, what do you want to survive? A regional failure, a AZ failure, you know, and I think that's one of those things about Cockroach that I love, um, you know, and I think it's, 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 it was unique to us. Um, and then we built that off of a, um, I think we used some Kelsey Hightower code to actually start doing that, didn't we, Josh? Like, wasn't that the, the, the prior art? Like, we use that as a baseline, right? Yeah, I think that is what convinced Chris Ada that he could build it. He was like, <laughs> You if Kelsey it. can do it, I can do it, basically, I guess. <laughs> Copy it in. Yeah, Kelsey. No problem. Uh, Kelsey's pretty smart, man. It's awesome. So, um, I, no, but I, I did, yeah, go on. Yeah, I, I wanted to point out, I think some of the issue we have maybe is a lack of sufficient confidence, but I think Kubernetes is moving forward really quickly. And though there's a lot of documentation, some of it is obsolete, some of it is about the future. So it's really hard to commit to doing things in a particular way, like writing your own custom operator. Because yeah. if you spend three weeks or a month doing it and then it ends up not working, you're screwed, right? So it helps to have people who have, um, you know, kind of made the way for you, uh, like Kelsey or yeah. 
some other people that we have working for us. Well, I, let me just do an advertisement for the CNCF and, and what's been built around Kubernetes. I mean, wow, what a community, guys. Like, yeah. I'm just, I'm honored and like, like to be a part of this thing. I, I think it's probably one of the most important and incredible communities of software developers and operators and admins I've ever been a part of. And I think it's, it's pretty awesome, right? And so, see, hey, by the way, um, Juan, I don't know if you just saw the last chat that came in, but can I nominate Juan for the most authentic IT guy background? So remember I said, the, uh, yeah, the best actor. yeah. <laughs> it's a, it's a fake background. You all actually, we could take pictures and send it out to everybody. You got to have like the, the authentic <laughs> IT background. It's like, a, it's actually like a physical works. It's like his garage workspace almost. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's I, a green but string. I, yeah. You know, funny enough, like, you know, I think having that community of people is, is really important. I'm an open source person, have been for a while. It is so incredibly important to have people. Uh, somebody had asked something about Docker Swarm a while back, difference between Kubernetes and Docker Swarm. And, I, you know, without getting into the details, I knew that, well, Docker Swarm didn't have a huge community around it. It was mostly Docker employees, right? And, like, by creating the CNCF and creating this whole community of people who all kind of are actually really respectful and want to share this information, it's this sort of thing. It's like, yeah, it's not just Kelsey who's giving out, you know, it's coasting a bit. Kelsey's amazing. And like some of the shit he does on stage is just awesome. Right. And like, but it's everybody. And it, you know, it started with Dan Cohn and it goes to Priyanka now and the leadership and Chris Anizek and what they do is just great. And they, they've really built a great community. I'm like I said, I'm just my, my small commercial for that. So, but, but you did mention something um, Juan, and I think operators is, is another topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart. You know, I think, you know, what Brandon Phillip, Brandon Phillips and Rob Zimski did at CoreOS, I was, I remember there was a conversation we had about calling them operators one day and, you know, to think about Kubernetes as a platform, to think about the extensibility of Kubernetes and, and how we actually run lots of different software to run on it. You know, I mean, look at what Red Hat's doing now. Like they have a whole marketplace of certified operators. So like it's push button run software on Kubernetes. It's awesome, right? Like, but you said something interesting to me, Juan. Um, you know, every operator, and I think what people do is is sometimes customize, right? And so what are the things that we're doing in an operator today from our own SRE team, not general cockroach DB product stuff. And I'll come back to that and the differences, but what are the, some mm -hmm. of the things that we're doing in an operator today for our team? Well, so, um, things, how things will be in the future and how things are today, two different things, right? Uh, we're building motivated by our on-prem customers want to uh, have a job of deploy to be, be more manageable to them, right? So they have a Kubernetes cluster, they're happy setting that up, but still deploying, um, deploying CockroachDB to that is not so trivial. So they want an operator and we started providing that for them. Eventually, we'll use the operator internally, but currently, um, you know, an operator is, I'm sorry, as I said before, an operator is not the full solution to everything you need to do to deploy and manage uh, CockroachDB, because you also need to provision, you need to set up uh, VPCs, right? Uh, network connections between your customer, private net, and yours, um, and so forth. So there's a lot of things that the operator cannot cover. So mm -hmm. we prefer to just write off all of our code in one uh, module which uh, speaks uh, as a client to the Kubernetes service and along with other services. Uh, that's why right. we didn't go for the operator from the beginning. Okay. Um, now, the operator can encapsulate best practices or um, peculiarities of your system, right? For example, we were talking before how we need to create a custom scheduler for Kubernetes uh, because we have to be very careful how we uh, scale and downscale. So we can incorporate that sort of wisdom into the operator and have this be packaged to the customer, uh, right. which is which is a great thing. Yeah. Yeah, and that's pretty straightforward for us. I mean, that's one of the benefits of running Cockroach database on Kubernetes. I mean, similar architecture, right? Scale up, scale down, etcd running and basically managing instance, you know, like what you want to do. And I think and then again, I guess another small commercial for this team and some of the work that we've done from our software engineering point of view. But like our implementation of Raft is actually affecting upstream etcd raft right and so like i know we ran into a pretty heavy problem like you know, cockroach is running in the global environment so running etcd in a single cluster or in a single region is pretty simple running etcd across you know small or multi-region planet and you're dealing with latencies of more than 150 200 milliseconds you know there's issues with that right so we had there was a problem called atomic replication i'm not going to get into this thing right now but 
our team is fixing things in Etsy in Raft in our own implementation and contributing that upstream. So I think some of the things we're seeing you guys, and that's why I was asking about the multi-region thing. I wanna talk about stateful sets as well a little bit here. Um, and I think that's unique for us as well. Um, and we're a very good consumer of that. But some of the things that we're running into because we are global and we're running into these things before, I think some other people are, we're contributing back upstream. So, you know, some really great software engineering. Again, kudos to our team. I mean, they just do a great job. So, um, but let's talk about stateful sets in, in Cockroach, right? So, I, I, you know, we didn't talk about this pre, pre, beforehand, guys, but like, um, I guess, Josh, are you using state? I mean, I, you know, I think stateful sets is a critical piece of how we deploy, right? Are we going to use daemon sets, stateful sets? Can you just explain what is stateful set? Again, this is kind of going back into the inter intermediate beginning stuff, but like it's important for people to understand why stateful sets are important and how we use it at, within for our instances. Sure, so uh, yeah, we, we use stateful sets. Um, they give us a few different things. One thing they do is you get, a, you get a pod with a consistent like ordinal, so a consistent ID. So like you get right. say a three node cluster, you have pod one, pod two, pod three. And each of those is attached to persistent storage. So in our case, uh, like GCP uh, disks. Um, and that's using that's using the whole PV PV claim or just you know straight mount PV, Josh. So the storage class is something that everybody should be familiar with in Kubernetes as well. It's really critical to understand, right? So is it using just PV PV claim or what, how are you guys doing that? Uh, it's a little abstracted, but it's not that abstracted. So yeah, you're, you're kind of aware of that, but maybe I'm not sure if you, I don't think you literally write the persistent volume claim yourself. I think you just write okay. that. Great. Um, yep. So yeah, so there's the disk part. And then the other part is that you have a stable network identity. Uh, and that's a little bit more cockroach to be specific. Like, I mean, any, any da database is going to want persistent storage. But uh, with cockroach DB, we need to be able to, each node needs to be able to address every other node via some stable network identity. And so what we're getting under the stable set is a DNS name that points to a specific node, which points to a specific disk. Right. And so stateful sets is basically, like, once stateful sets came along, it helps applications or databases like us immensely, right? Like, I mean, we could have done this with daemon sets, um, but that's a, just a much more manual process, right? I mean, that, 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 that moment in the, uh, I'm sorry, I was just answering a question, you guys. I'm trying to do both questions and talk to you guys and engage. I, 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 you know, I don't have my friend Tim Bale on this call with me right now today, so I'm trying to do a couple <laughs> things at once. Um, it's just me, so. Um, but I, thank you, Josh. I, I think it's a critical piece for people to actually understand. Um, again, Cockroach Database kind of architected very similar to, 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 to Kubernetes. Um, let's move on. Another topic we wanted to talk about, and there was a question in here about um, uh, security. And I think it's always a concern. I think security, networking, when you talk about Kubernetes, you're gonna talk about these two things. Like, you don't have to be a networking expert, but I tell you what, it's gonna help a whole hell of a lot if you understand networking, right? Like, but security as well. Uh, you know, at the, at the cockroach layer, you know, we're just, we're connecting instances of cockroach via TLS and we're not gonna talk about that. But we do have to talk about certificates and that sort of stuff in Cockroach. How do we deal with that um, on the Cockroach Cloud team? I don't know, Juan or Josh. Oh, let's, Juan, you haven't spoken in a while. I'll go to you. So, but if, if you want to just push it down to Josh, I'm totally happy with that too. Like, how do what are we what are we doing for certificates in in Kubernetes? Well, we use Vault, uh, which is a HashiCorp most of them, and. Uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, I think, Josh, I think, help me with the details. We have one certificate per customer, per cluster, right? Um, um, I don't know. I don't know what else to say about it. <laughs> yeah. We're, yeah, we're, we're running Vault in, the, in, in this like control plane that's used to manage all the clusters. And then Vault not in the serving path. So like when we create a specific cluster for a specific customer, we have these yeah. kind of isolated clusters right now. We, we, we write the certs to Kubernetes secrets. We make them Kubernetes secrets. And then the staple set pods just load up the cert and Cockroach DB can handle the like TLS connection and all that. Right. So the implementation pattern for a software as a service, Josh, would be to run Vault centrally on some central control plane and then use secrets within each instance to manage the certificate. Is that how that works? I mean, is that what we're still looking at? Yeah, that's the pattern we're following. I mean, the, the main reason we're following that pattern is because we, you know, you could imagine that Cocker TV can talk to Vault or, or something like that. If, if that was the case, then 
it's not as good for security, at least not with more thought, because then, then like the customer cluster has access to this thing that has keys for all the customers, right? So instead, like, yeah, Vault Vault writes things to Kubernetes, but but the customer cluster, which is accessible by the customer, cannot talk to Vault, right? So what is the, I just newbie question? What's the value of Vault in this then? I mean, what are, what is what is Vault providing in this equation, Josh? Like, what is the value of it? Um, it's just this really powerful secret store. You can do yeah. a lot of things. You can just, I mean, if you have a, if you have a secret that you want to just store there, you can do that. You can say like, I'm going to write this key to vault and vault will keep it and handle encrypting it and all that. Another right. thing you can do is you can say vault, I want you to be my CA, like give me certificates. So we'll do that. Other thing you can do is you can say vault, give me a project owner token to mess with this GCP project. Yeah. It's just a tool that kind of gives this uniform access for yeah. lots of different kinds of secrets. And it's super powerful and it's everywhere and it just works. Like it's just solid. Like again, shout out to my friends at HashiCorp and you know, gosh, my mentor, Dave McChanit, who's running that place now or, you know, with, with the, with the team, of course, uh, they've done such a great job on that product and you know, you can go and try and use it. And I'm sure the team over there would be real happy that I'm doing this, but in the same breath, I also want to talk about one of the unique, uh, I think one of the, the unique characteristics of running software as a service, if you're going to do that on Kubernetes, is then provisioning of hardware, right? Like we get a new cluster, right? We get a request for a self-service cluster. How are we provisioning new hardware in AWS or GCP, right? What, what tools are we using and, and, and what was our path to actually figure out what we wanted to do for that, Josh? Uh, yeah, so we, we were initially depending on Terraform, uh, but again, we had this, this future in our heads where there's this service that creates clusters and adds regions to existing clusters and all that. And we didn't really want our, our code to be like generating Terraform configs that then get exact by Terraform. We just thought that was like a little messy. So we looked at Pulumi, which is mm -hmm. very similar to Terraform, except that you, you can configure it with Go code, which is the, what our whole stack is written in. Um, right. And so that's what we're using. So like we spin up GCP projects, AWS accounts and uh, manage Kubernetes clusters with. Right. Yeah. And, and I think what the, the Plumi team, what Joe and the team has done over there is pretty powerful uh, as an alternative for this. And, and I'm with you, dude. I don't want to actually deal with YAML. And I, you know, I, I, I like, that's just not a, and like using this as a, a way of actually coding all of this, I think. And I think if anybody hasn't checked out Plumi again, I, I like to do commercials for things, companies I think are doing some really <laughs> cool stuff. Hey, look at, I mean, people are listening, go check it out. I, I, I love the team and I, you know, there's some really good friends over there. And, and again, you know, I think Terraform does a great job. And I think people are really familiar with, with Terraform. There are other things and there's reasons that different teams use different things. And again, it comes back to being as authentic as, as Juan's background. Each team is going to be different <laughs> and you're, and Hey, come on, Juan, right. Um, <laughs> yeah. And being comfortable with, 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 with what's right for you and your team, I think is, is always kind of the, you know, the, the deciding factor, you know, again, like, I think it's really quick, you know, it's really important. Uh, somebody was actually asking about our operator. I'll answer that while we're talking about it, you know, uh, we'll, we'll publish our, uh, an update to our operator. I know we have one that's out there that's in uh, kind of an alpha state, but, you know, um, John Kendall on our team uh, as a product manager, we'll, we'll have an updated operator coming out here very soon. Um, so, but how much did we, how much did the work that we're doing in running software as a service influence our own operator, Juan? I know we talked about this a little bit, right? But how much of the work you guys are doing actually translated over into what our customers are going to use for an operator? Well, I think, frankly, a lot of the things that we have to deal with are not in the operator because a lot of it is provisioning, like we were just talking about using Pulu right. and so forth. A lot of it is, um, uh, you know, creating uh, VPNs or VPCs uh, from different parts of the clouds, and they all have different processes or different ways in which you have to do that. We use Pulumi for that too, uh, not yeah. only Pulumi. Um, so all that cannot be, it's not in the scope of any Kubernetes operator, right? It's not in the scope of Kubernetes. Right. Uh, so, so yeah, there's a lot of work that we have to do outside of it. So yeah, a lot of what we do is not in that operator. Um, right. 
but it's still a good encapsulation of what we do with Kubernetes. Uh, we are trying to put all of our, all that we know about how to manage CRDB in Kubernetes into that operator, right? Yeah. That won't be the case two weeks from now, but I think <laughs> in a few months it will be. Yeah, I think it's interesting too. I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of organizations adopt Cockroach Database and run it internally as a service. Like they want to, you know, make it available to their own developers who, who want to run a, you know, just create an application and just run it on, you know, the next generation database that is going to help their operators and is, you know, is going to help fit with what their plan is from a deployment provisioning point of view, right? And I think running Cockroach as a service internally is becoming more and more popular. And it's, um, you know, just, I'm just looking at the customers that we're dealing with now. I think the work yeah. that we're doing right now on this team will, 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 will benefit that implementation yeah. pattern immensely, immensely. And I think, you know, it'll be really interesting to see how this works. And I think it comes to my next point and, and I want to talk about serverless. I want to talk about multi-region and kind of directionally where we're going with you know, with, with Cockroach Cloud. And I think there's some real big challenges uh, in what we're trying to do. So I don't know, I don't know what, which one you want to take this, but you know, we, I laugh at the term serverless. You all laugh at it too. And I, you know, when we were preparing for this, we were both laughing about the concept. And I, I guess I have to be the devil's advocate in this thing, but like, I don't know, like I, Juan or Josh, you raise your hand, which one of you wants to define the concept of serverless? And then we'll talk about it in the context of Cockroach TV. Look at Josh is like leaning in. Juan. I call Juan, you do it. <laughs> oh man. Uh, serverless is a server that you don't have to know about. Uh, so it's right. server full. Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, you basically it's like instead of uh, writing, focusing on the machine that you're going to run code on, you write the code that is run for you in some undefined place, I guess. Right. Which means you have very little control, but it's easier, I guess. Um, yeah. But there's also another angle to it, right? Which is, uh, it's easier to, well, it's trivial to deploy, trivial to start, trivial to stop. And, um, you know, maybe you only get to pay for the resources it uses while it's doing something. Right? Yeah. That's, that's part of that. I think. Yeah. That's a pretty good, I, it's really good. Honestly, I just find it like, it's funny, like, what is the cloud but a bunch of other people's servers? What is serverless other than <laughs> uh, just a bunch of servers running? It? It's not serverless. It's an abstraction layer, like you were talking about, Josh. Like at at, at Google, was, there was there was this nice abstraction layer between like everything that was just happening. You know, like like the Borg team basically just gave you this environment, and you could write against it. And like that's that's really really powerful. How do you make that available in the, in the broader tenets? And I I like that comparison a little bit more. Go on. Yeah, that's why I don't like the term. Is because like. Right. No one ever used that term at Google, and there were all these like amazing multi-tenant services, and almost like right. the definition of service at Google was implied multi-tenancy. Right. So it's like, yeah, a database as a service like should be, should ideally be rather multi-tenant. At least that's like certainly an interesting direction. You know. Right. And and it just it just comes back to like I I can't I can't say enough how. Um, if people on the call want to actually see where all this stuff originated and actually really get a primer and how this stuff works, this paper, which is, uh, I've, I've read it a couple times, uh, I think is just incredibly important for people as a, as a primer to understand a lot of these concepts. And, you know, my thinking on serverless and what that means for us really is rooted in, in a lot of these, these core concepts that you guys have lived before. And I think it's really important, but running a database is very different. Right. And so, Guys, what are the challenges that we have in terms of, you know, for me, when we think of Cockroach DB and what we're going to offer as a serverless is like, it's not your own AWS instance. It's not your own, you know, it's not, you know, your machine type and it, we're running all that and we're provisioning Cockroach across all that. So what are the things that we're doing in the background, Josh, to actually make that happen uh, and, and make that a reality? Um. Yeah, it's 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 such a big change. I mean, it's a it's totally it's huge, and it, it's a kind of affecting like everything, like the whole stack. So yeah. I think I guess I would split it into two two really big things it's affecting. So one thing is there's this, you know, Cockroach TV has layered architecture. One of the ideas of it is that you build SQL database on top of a distributed KV store. Right. So the way that our current serverless architecture works is that we uh, build a multi-tenant KV store, a single multi-tenant KV store. So like a, a single set of N cockroach DB servers join a cluster and become 
a, a KV store. And then what we do is we create po SQL pods, pods that actually, you know, do all the SQL stuff. And those talk to that KV store. And those SQL pods are per customer. So you, so you do have some right. isolation of your own SQL pod, but you, but you are sharing the underlying, uh, what we call a KV cluster. Yeah. And that's just yeah. like... I want to point out that the SQL pod is not just one, of course, right? We're, that's right. also distributed. That's right. Yeah. yeah, and that's in the software itself, right? That's it, like, so this is what I mean. Like, this is not a simple task, right? This is application side changes that have to happen. Mm -hmm. But then from the SRE and like the management of the environment itself, what are some of the things that are our biggest challenges? We talk about multi-region and, you know, to me, guys, like, you know, federated clusters. I mean, the SIG Federation group in Kubernetes has started, stop, started, stop, start. Like, you know, whole companies have been created to start to, you know, how do I create a single control plane? My friends at Upbound, another shout out to a company that I think the world of and what they're doing with cross plane and everything else. Like, this is not a simple problem, right? And so, you know, are we looking at other tools and other things that actually help kind of think about like, you know, that, that layer, you know, the, the, the Kubernetes layer at a, in, in a global format. I want to say that one of the major differences that I forgot to mention earlier on uh, between Borg and Kubernetes is that Borg is also multi-region. Uh, oh yeah, that's a big, yeah, big yeah. difference, so, yeah. Yeah, you can, you can schedule and orchestrate things across the world without, without thinking twice about it. Um, so yeah, this is a big problem. Uh, are we using tools? We're not planning to. Uh, we roll uh, using partly Pulumi, we roll our own uh, like network topology to link all these uh, multiple Kubernetes clusters together. Right. It's, it's rather painful. So if the right tool or the right Kubernetes feature came about, I think we would seriously consider using it. Yeah. And it, 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 you know, it hasn't come about because it's really just difficult to solve. Yeah. Right. And to me, I don't know about you guys, but like, I feel it's the networking piece is the, that's the, that's the killer. Um, right, because each cluster is going to run its own network. Each pod has its own IP, and, and we've been dealing with that, right, Josh? Uh, I think that there's, I think of kind of the, the multi-region networking as being a little bit separate from the serverless. I mean, they're related, but yeah. the, the, I think that like the serverless thing, as much as I'm excited about it, as an SRE who gets paged at 3 a.m., I'm afraid <laughs> of it because yeah. it's a whole different thing. It means that like customer A can come in and cause problems for customer B which is not yeah. possible in our architecture that exists today where everyone has their own cluster. Right. It's a whole other thing. And like this company is learning to do that and yeah. it's going to be like rough. Um, yeah. On the other hand, the multi-region thing is like this cost that we're paying in our automation software. We had to figure out how to handle it, but yeah. no production issue has ever happened in relation to that like multi-region setup. And it, it basically right. paid the cost once and now it's in the software yeah. and you have to worry about it. Yeah, I think it's interesting. And, and you're right, Josh. I'm sorry, but you know, life of an SRE, dude. You know, three in the morning, buddy. You're gonna get the call. So, I, I did want to um, actually do a shout out. And and you know, the, the multi-region thing is one of these things that I find extremely interesting. We have done it before. We, you know, Alex Robinson, who was here for quite some time, actually had a whole bunch of material on this. If anybody is interested in actually how to run a multi-region Kubernetes cluster. Um, if you go into our docs, which I have to actually give a shout out to our docs team, every single one of these cockroach hours, if anybody has been on this before, you know that I emote about Jesse and the team and what they do, because I don't know, I've been in software a long time. I've never seen docs as, uh, as, as rich as this. So um, if you just do a Kubernetes search within our docs, uh, it does a pretty good job. There's a lot of material here in terms of you know, orchestrating cockroach TV on Kubernetes, um, looking at cockroach TV performance on top of Kubernetes, um, but there is uh, orchestrating across multi. Yeah, so this is, I think this is our multi region stuff, right, guys? Anyway, we have a whole uh, method of actually running multi region that, that is, uh, that, that's available to everybody, which is a, it's a kind of a pattern for Cockroach DB, but also kind of a pattern in general if you're looking to deploy software multi region, because, you know, federating across clusters is just, it's, it's, uh, difficult, let's just say, uh, just, you know, I mean, if you, if you're going to go down that path, but check out our docs, it's, it's extremely valuable. I don't know, um, guys, I, I, I think we've hit all the core topics that, you know, you, you, we, we, we spoke to before. Um, there's been a whole mess of questions here. Um, I'm not even sure where to start. I don't know, Josh, or I know Juan, you were looking at a couple of them. Is there any of these in particular you wanted to pick off? I, I think you, 
I've been looking at them opportunistically, so I don't really know yeah. what's left. Uh, I will take a look, but I, I, I will have to go silent for a while. Yeah, I know. It's a uh, sorry, guys. I mean, the conversation's been really great, but and I and I haven't been able to get really deep into these. Any guidelines um, of CRDB memory footprint management? That's that's a good one. Hundred dollar question. Yeah. If you, if, uh, do you have any guidelines for us? Would be my 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 question. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, we have a lot of production issues in, in this category where, where a cluster runs into memory. Um, yeah. There, I guess yeah. our guideline would be uh, what we do is we're generally running a Cocker HTTP pod on a VM with nothing else running. There. And if you're if you're going to do that, then Cocker HTTP is going to be aware of the memory limits, and it's going to work one way. If you're going to run Cocker HTTP pods on VMs with other stuff running, you need to like think very carefully about your resource limits. Um, it's a little hand wavy, but. I mean, Cockroach TV will adjust somewhat to the memory that is available, but it does need, you know, it does need a minimum. Yeah. And uh, it's not yeah. always graceful uh, at failing when it just needs more and they cannot find it. Uh, that's getting improved upon as well. Um, what was the other thing I was going to say about memory? Oh yeah, the, oh. Um, yeah, go ahead. No, go on, go on one. I have a good question for us, so go on about memory. No, I, for, I forgot what I was going to say, so why don't you ask your Oh question. my God, I'm sorry. I just, I just was exclaiming, I, oh, I got a question. Um, <laughs> what, I, it, actually guys, this is a pretty good question. What tools are we using to monitor um, our Kubernetes cluster? What, what are we doing for that? It's a great question, actually. Uh, what we do right now is we run uh, Prometheus clusters Prometheus Alert Manager and Grafana in each customer cluster on Kubernetes. So mm -hmm. like the Kubernetes cluster we have dedicated to customer A, we're running Prometheus Alert Manager and uh, Grafana. And you know, if it's a multi-region cluster, each, each region is running Prometheus and they're scraping all the regions so it's replicated. Then we have a meta monitoring Prometheus instance that's sitting outside of the cluster. It's gonna page if those, uh, those prom if the problems for the customer are down. Yeah. And then uh, observability, Josh, are we doing, are we using open tracing? I, and forgive me for not knowing. Are we using open tracing or anything like that? I know internally in, you know, I think in, uh, in 20.2, I think we start using open tracing for queries internally in the application itself. Are, are we using that internal or within the SRE chain at all? Like the admin UI has some distributed tracing stuff. Up, right. You know, anything kind of like sitting outside of Cockroach GB itself. Right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Which we could, that'd be cool. Yeah. Well, hey, it was just another opportunity for me to like, you know, pump up another one of my friends, the the, the yeah. team over at Lightstep and what they're doing. Um, love those guys too. So I, I listen, HashiCorp, Palumi, Upbound, Lightstep, you all owe me a beer. I, I, you know, you're, I hope you're on, but whatever. Hey, Jim, um, I remember what I was going to say that, um, you know, I think that the roadmap or whatever, eventually when you run out of memory, the idea is that you scale horizontal, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, fortunately we have to deal with choosing a particular instance type in one of the clouds and kind of, it's hard to change that uh, as you run, but, um, but you know, you can always scale horizontal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was a question here about running CockroachDB with Rook. With Rook. Um, absolutely. Um, I know uh, the Rook team had built out uh, the uh, integration with Ceph actually is the underlying distributed storage layer with Rook and there's a Rook operator for CockroachDB that's available. Seth uh, on the Rook team, who's uh, you know at, at Red Hat. Um, I know he did a lot of work on that. So there is, a, there is an operator that actually was built out to deploy us on Rook. It's not something that we're using internally, not definitely not in, in our team for Cockroach Cloud, um, but we've had customers go down that path, looking at that operator to provision uh, provision storage underneath Kubernetes. And I did what the Rook team has done. I think it's great. So what Seth and Tina are doing. So um, let's see here. Yeah, I, you know, guys, I there's just there's so many. I, I I'm just I'm just thankful for all the interaction. <laughs> I like. There is so many questions here. Um, there's just been a whole lot. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to. We're two minutes before the top of the hour. I'm going to cut this. Um, and, and I think there was, I think we actually hit a lot of the questions, a lot of more about multi-region. 
Um, some of them were about staple sets and what that means for us. I think there was a little bit of an overlap if you guys are looking through the questions. I think we hit a lot of these topics. There's a couple that were a little bit more in depth that I'll definitely get our, our, our solutions engineering team to, on to, to answer. So if you have a question in the chat that we didn't get to, um, by all means, uh, we'll go off and do that. Um, there was a question here and it was a student asking about, you know, where do you learn more about Kubernetes? Um, and there's just a lot of resources out there, you know, starting at the kubernetes.io website and, and just going through the tools that they have. Um, there's a there's a tool that O'Reilly has now. If anybody hasn't seen this, it's called Katakoda, K-A-T-A-C-O-D-A. Katakoda.com has some really amazing hands-on terminal tutorials in your browser. You don't even have to spin up the cluster uh, to actually go out and learn Kubernetes. I can't I think it's really, really cool. Catacoda is awesome. And a, lot, a couple of people are doing some plus ones here. Um, and and it's just, it, it's really, it's really powerful. You don't have to worry about provisioning Kubernetes to get everything out of it. Like you just go play with it, with the terminal. It's kind of cool. Um, we're going to do a lot with Catacoda here with uh, Cockroach Database as well, which should be pretty interesting over the, over the next, over the next world. So um, I do want to actually answer this one last, what's our take on the tweet? Cockroach DB is the spanner, what Kubernetes is the Borg. I love I loved Kelsey. Kelsey, thank you so much. Because Kelsey says nice things about us in the Twitter sphere. Uh, and, and one of the things he said was exactly this tweet. And it's, um, if you look at Google Cloud Spanner and what Google has done for a database, a distributed relational database, that architecture, and look at, I love Google Exhaust, guys, just as much as anybody. Kubernetes is Google Exhaust. The white paper for Google Cloud Spanner is definitely wonderful, amazing contribution to the world. Uh, we built a company off of that basic architecture. And, you know, if, if you look at what Google did uh, and, and building a database that's actually going to run on Borg, a relational, truly transactional database, that was Spanner. Uh, and so but that's kind of tied to Borg and kind of tied to their infrastructure. Whereas what we're doing with Cockroach is let's, let's, let's do something that's devoid of Borg and devoid of or separated from the, from the, from the hardware that, that Spanner is going to run from and let it, let it run in any cloud. Uh, so that's that's the description of that. Thank you um, for whoever put that into the chat because it's one of my favorite tweets of all time. And thanks, Kelsey, for doing it. So, um, guys, thank you, Juan, Josh. I hope this. Did you guys have fun? Oh yeah. Good. I, yeah, no, I'd like to talk to all five hundred people online, but I know. Yeah. I know. And it's like I, I, you know, I when we talked about this, it's like I don't get to see you guys in the lunchroom, but this is, you know. <laughs> Hopefully we can continue these kind of conversations. So uh, guys, thank you so much. That was extremely valuable. Um, I hope it was available or valuable for everybody in the audience. Um, you know, we try to make it as, as broad uh, yet get into some more technical concepts. I hope it was intermediate. I hope it wasn't false advertising um, and, and, and hope everybody kind of pulled away a couple of different things. I tried to give you at least a white paper and a couple of different companies to look at. So, hey, you know, there's that. Um, Please go try Cockroach Cloud uh, and, and have issues with it. So Josh gets woken up at two in the morning. Um, sorry, Josh. Um, but he'll be on it and we will make sure you're, you're you know, we have this team of SREs that, that want to, he doesn't get up, he's the manager. Um, no, no, no. I'm, go, I'm, going, I'm, going, I'm going on call. What kind of manager know, does it feel the pain? Come I know, on. I know. Uh, but go out and try Cockroach Cloud. You know, we get a one month free trial. Uh, go out and spin up a cluster. We love it when people spin up clusters. Try for a month, uh, you know, run an application on it, build something or download CockroachDB core um, from our website uh, and, and use CockroachDB. Just become familiar with the, the value here. We didn't talk anything about the value that Cockroach Database does, uh, but there's lots of, of stuff about what we do on our website. Again, I would check out our documentation if, if, you're, if you really want to geek out an infrastructure or a distributed database. There's some really cool, great material that the team has done. Life of a transaction, I will just say, check that out. It's awesome. Um, Josh, Juan, thank you guys again. Thank you, Jim. Uh, and, and to everybody who joined us uh, all over the world, uh, the engagement was incredible on this on this webinar. And um, I want, just wanted to thank everybody for joining again. It's, it's, this is a, a joy for me. So, all right, everybody, thank you, and have a uh, have a great Wednesday. Is it Wednesday? I think it's Wednesday. So what year? Yeah. Exactly right. Thanks, 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 everybody. Bye.